Welcome to Discovery Watch with John Kaiser. I'm your host, Jim Goddard. John, last week you updated us on the Chichu project of Sirius Resources. This week, the neighbor to the south, Azimut Exploration, announced work plans for its joint venture with Gold Corp and East Main. What is Azimut's exploration strategy this year? Um, Azimut uh, put out a news release this past week explaining what it plans to do. It and its partners, uh, Gold Corp and East Main, which each have 37%, while Azimut has 26%, plan to spend about $3.9 million in a two-phase program. About half of that, 4,400 meters, is going to be done between August and October. And it's going to be focused on the southern half of the Chichu Tonalite intrusion. Now, it would be worthwhile to get a little bit of background. Uh, when the Eleanor discovery was made by Andre Gaumont's Virginia Gold back in 2005, this whole area ended up being staked and uh, turned into an area play. And East Main and Gold Corp, uh, they farmed into this land and uh, ended up focusing on what became known as the JT outcrop, which is a mineralization that sits west of the tonalite intrusion. Now, during the early years of the uh, area play, the tonalite was dismissed as a big hunk of uh, tombstone rock, you know, unaltered. There was outcrop where you could see it. Everything else was covered by overburden. So the assumption was this is some later stage intrusion that came in here, and where it is, there is no gold. So the exploration, interestingly, tracked, stayed away from the tonalite intrusion, and uh, they drilled a line of holes sort of tracking the western flank of this intrusion, hoping to hit something that uh, was associated with the JT outcrop, and that also explained a substantial uh, regional uh, arsenic and gold in soil anomaly that basically seemed to emanate from the uh, the Chichu intrusion. But they really got nothing, and the whole thing was a big disappointment. But about six years ago, uh, Sirius Resources, which uh, was had uh, up staked the Chichu intrusion, or a good chunk of it, uh, ended up uh, doing a deal with uh, partner Golden Valley, to earn 100% of the Chichu intrusion because field work had encountered some gold mineralization in a part of the uh, eastern part of the Chichu intrusion that was not like the, the bigger exposed part. And so this little company toiling away at 5, 10 cents and all that uh, uh, did a fair amount of work, originally had the idea that this is an intrusion-related gold system, uh, which uh, would probably be a large tonnage, low-grade, open pitable system, and didn't really get a lot of credibility from the market because, like, who needs this, these uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 gram per ton multi-million ounce deposits when gold's at $1,200, $1,400? The optionality play in gold had pretty much faded away. But last year, there was a change in thinking at Sirius about the Chichu intrusion. They had had these periodic high-grade intervals that uh, didn't really hang together, and they suspected that they may have been drilling the deposit uh, in the wrong direction, that there were northeast structures cutting through the intrusion, which hosted higher-grade mineralization. So most of their subsequent drilling last year and this year, and also planned for uh, for, for later this, this year, is in a northwesterly direction to hit these structures on a perpendicular. But uh, even that has not really uh, um, put together the zones. You know, they get a high-grade interval here, another one there, but they haven't yet been able to put together a resource model. Now, both groups are focused this year on trying to better understand what controls this system. Sirios in the in an area at the northeastern flank of this intrusion where several of its interpreted structures uh, exited is just waiting for a permit to go and strip a hundred meter by hundred meter area, you know, like like two football fields, just clean off the overburden, wash the rock, and then have geologists do detailed mapping and cut these 100-meter channel samples, which is kind of like a uh, horizontal drill hole so that you can see how the mineralization behaves across across this body of rock. 
and they hope to better understand what the controls are so that they can design a drilling campaign to properly assess the gold content of this system. Uh, Azimut and its partners are going to be doing something similar in the area of what they call the Moni Prospect, which is a high-grade outcrop just south of the border with um, uh, 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 Sirios, and, and it's sort of roughly close to the middle of the Chichu intrusion. So they also plan to strip this area and study it better. Now, Jean-Marc Luen does not think there are any high-grade structures within this system that control the mineralization. He thinks that the mineralization evolved with the final stages of this intrusions and placements, whereas if you have high-grade structures that you're seeing, this suggests that the uh, the original rock came in first and a hydrothermal system came in later and would have exploited any cracks and fissures in the system where the gold would have uh, preferentially dropped out and created the high-grade mineralization. He thinks they're dealing with a bulk tonnage system such as Dominique Doucette originally thought. And I think the work by both groups this year will go a long way towards uh, telling us what kind of beast is this Chichu intrusion. Now, in terms of drilling, uh, Azimut plans to tackle three areas. Uh, Sirius's work has all mostly concentrated in the northeastern end of the Chichu intrusion where it has had the best results. Just south of the border, Azimut uh, and its partners have intersected a couple of interesting holes. One was 45 meters of 4.9 gram per ton, which they got earlier this year. And another in the same area was 144 meters of 0.65 grams per ton gold. And that's that sort of smoke that uh, Sirius was getting in the earlier years that would support a, uh, a bulk tonnage type scenario. So they will be drilling more holes in that area. Now, another area that they plan to tackle is the southwestern corner of the Chichu intrusion, where it goes from running, where, where the contact runs sort of east-west and starts to turn north. This is south of the JT area, and there's never been any drill holes into this area, and is diametrically opposite from the uh, focal part in the northeast corner where, where uh, uh, Sirius has done all its work. So this is going to be an intriguing target to see if there, in this area, it is also similarly mineralized. And the third area that they intend to tackle is along that line of uh, holes that was drilled uh, north and south of the uh, JT uh, outcrop, except this time they will step eastwards and drill right through the contact of the Chichu intrusion to see if they can get the uh, mineralization at the margin between the meta sediments and the intrusion and also into the rock. This has never been drilled and uh, if the what Sirius has encountered on the northeastern side uh, is similar to what's here and Jean-Marc Luan's theory that this whole thing was the mineralization is associated with the intrusions and placement itself, then we could start seeing this thing come together as a very substantial mineralized system. And then in the winter, uh, January, when everything's frozen, they plan to uh, tackle a new target uh, called the FD prospect, which is uh, to the northwest. And the other thing that could be interesting in the summer, they and another junior called Everton are partners with uh, Hecla on the Openaka B property, which uh, adjoins uh, Sirius's Chichu project to the east. Uh, uh, Hecla has been chasing uh, so, sort of, you know, sporadic mineralization. Uh, it has not really hung together in an interesting manner. Uh, they will be doing a, a drill program this year, which will vest them for 50%, and that will become the basis for going to uh, 70% by funding uh, feasibility scale work or just leaving at 50%. Now, it's a very large chunk of land, and the thinking about this region is there's a lot more going on than the Eleanor Gold Deposit, 12 kilometers to the northwest, uh, and the, 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 the Chichu. So it's going to be a very interesting summer for for both groups, uh, Sirius and Azimuth and its partners, uh, 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 Gold Corp and East Main on the uh, uh, Eleanor South joint venture. Discovery Watch with John Kaiser. We'll be back right after the break. 
Lotus Ventures Inc. is a BC-based medical marijuana company poised to launch into the rapidly evolving cannabis sector. Lotus is in the final review stage of the Health Canada approvals to become a licensed producer, having arranged facility financing of up to $12 million, plus building permits for its prototype indoor production facility. Shares trade under the symbol J on the Canadian Securities Exchange. Visit our website at lotusventures.ca. I'm Brian Fowler, President of Blind Creek Resources Limited, listed on the TSX Venture Exchange, ticker symbol BCK. Blind Creek is focused in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia. The company's key property is the Blend Project, one of the largest undeveloped lead-zinc silver deposits in Western Canada, plus plans to advance the recently acquired, fully permitted, historic engineer gold mine in the Atlan District of Northwestern BC. Check us out at blindcreekresources.com. Welcome back. We're chatting with John Kaiser. John, Camino Minerals has been falling like a rock after publishing drill results from the Los Chapitos project in Peru during the past couple of weeks. What's going on? Well, there's a couple things going on. First of all, um, the follow-up drilling on the Adriana zone has not lived up to the promise of the Discovery RC hole, which... Uh, gave us 1.3% copper over 106 meters in April. The company at that point switched to core drilling for two reasons. One, it suspected that it was losing copper mineralization, uh, being just blown, copper oxide mineralization being blown away so that the upper portion of the hole was understating the reality. And secondly, the, the magnetite that they were going through, which itself doesn't really have any copper, it tended to trap the RC rig, and they had terrible deviation, and they weren't able to drill into the targets uh, that they had, uh, had generated for, for their program. So they brought in the core rig, and it came up with uh, 168.5 meters of 0.72% copper, went where it was supposed to, but it was a lower grade. So the copper oxide grades did improve, uh, and so, yes, they were losing some of the copper copper grade in the uh, copper oxide portion of the hole, but they suspect now that the earlier high grade, the, the 1.5% to 2% in the uh, uh, sulfides from the RC hold, they were losing the waste rock so that it was being enriched and overstating the copper grade. So the market uh, has uh, been disappointed that... Uh, uh, that we are not seeing a high grade, you know, one to two percent copper system developing at depth. Uh, the grades of, uh, you know, 0.7 to one percent are impressive if they are near surface, but for underground mining, that's not going to be big enough. In addition, the widths have not been as fantastic as might have been hoped. Now, the other thing that they just published yesterday was holes from the Caddy target, which is about uh, one kilometer to the southeast. And these holes came in lower grade and with much shorter intervals. So the uh, back of the napkin type estimates people like myself were doing, saying, okay, if this Adriana zone connects to the Caddy, we're going to have so many, uh, you know, 50, 100 million tons. Uh, that math does not seem to be working anymore. So market disappointment that this is not shaping up to be the discovery that it was initially thought that this was another one of these one-hole wonders where follow-up drilling just never repeats the uh, glory of the initial hole. This is what's uh, putting pressure on the market. However, there is another thing putting pressure on the, the Camino market, and that is the fact that uh, there's 10 million warrants at 25 cents which uh, should expire in several years. However, because the stock traded over 40, per, 40 cents for the uh, required 20 days or something like that, uh, uh, management has the right to accelerate the expiry. And all it needs to do is put out a news release saying, we are accelerating it. You have 30 days. It's going to be like August 29th or something like that. Exercise them at 25 cents or they die. Now, the 10 million... That's a pretty big, big chunk. That, that's like a 15, 20 percent of uh, fully diluted in the company, and it also represents a potential two and a half million dollars. 
And uh, I talked to the CEO, Ken McNaughton, and he indicated that they are very, very close to making a formal decision to pull the trigger. And there are good reasons to do this because these warrants represent an overhang. The company raised $5 million at 95 cents with no warrants uh, uh, back back in May. Uh, this will become free trading in sometime in, in, in early September or, or late August. And, uh, and, and, and right now we have a problem because the stock's down at 40, 50 cents and the warrant holders, they just short against the warrants, uh, uh, and then hope to cover when it goes down. They, they try not to exercise it. So forcing these in the money warrants to be exercised is a strategically smart thing. And warrant holders have been guessing this is coming. They've seen the results not confirm. Uh, or be the kind that draw in new audiences, new buyers. Everybody's looking at this and saying, well, it's not shaping up to be great. There's this warrant overhang. So some of these warrant holders, I suspect, are busy selling right now so that they can raise money to exercise because we are pretty much still in that fairly bearish market that has been in place since about April. Um, there has not been much money, new money coming into the resource sector, and all of a sudden these... Uh, Players have to come up with two and a half million dollars within potentially 30 days. That's going to create a self-fulfilling downside uh, prophecy for the stock. So this is the main reason why it's falling like a rock. However, the initial reason that this project is not shaping up to be as uh, good as initially expected, I believe this may be a misguided reason. And this window, when the warrants are accelerated, could be a very interesting period for uh, discovery watchers, particularly ones who have watched this from the sideline, such, such as myself. Uh, in the presentation that accompanied yesterday's news release, on the Adriana slide, there is a hole plotted called number 12. And I asked Ken about this, and he would not say, how deep it was. He would not say any visuals. He says they're not going to publish any visuals. And the reason he is being very coy about this hole is this hole is very important for the future of Los Chapitos. What got me excited about the uh, Adriana target uh, back in April was that uh, they had done an IP survey over that whole stretch from uh, from Adriana, about four, four kilometers down to, uh, to the Vicky Pillar outcrops. And at a 250 meter depth, a chargeability, a sizable chargeability anomaly shows up and it's offset somewhat to the southwest from where the, they've done all the drilling. And these, these types of chargeability anomalies usually represent sulfides. But sulfides can be just iron sulfides, pyrite, pyrotite, what, what, whatever. Um, but it doesn't need to have any metal. However, in this context of an IOCG system, one that just has the C copper and no gold in it, it is possible that this is where copper enrichment took place. And this hole, number 12, basically intersects the heart of this IP anomaly. Uh, They've plotted a surface trace uh, that's about, using the scale, that's about 300 meters. Uh, on a vertical, it would have been 350 to 60 meters deep, and it would have been a fairly lengthy hole of around 460 to 470 meters. So this hole has been drilled in an angle, not yet done on this property. It's been drilled right through the uh, heart of this uh, chargeability anomaly, and uh you know, management owns an XRF unit. They can measure the core and see whether or not there's a meaningful quantity of copper. They already know what is in this core. But, of course, they're not saying anything. And last time they did that with hole number two, it turned out uh, that uh, the, the rush assay and all this stuff, uh, well, it was pretty much bare and it had stayed in magnetite. So, so they are very good at keeping secrets. In this case, the question that Discovery Watchers need to wonder, are they seeing the goods or are they just seeing iron sulfides that mean nothing? And these results probably won't be available until late August. Uh, 
and if the warrants are accelerated, all those warrant holders are going to have to make a decision without knowing whether it is the right decision. And it's a very important outcome because uh, three, three to four kilometers to the southeast, there is a similar substantial chargeability anomaly uh, uh, at the 250 meter depth. And there's also good surface showing in the caddy area where drilling's not showing up any anything particularly interesting, just shorter intervals of copper mineralization. There is no chargeability anomaly. So at the opposite ends of uh, this uh, three to four kilometer strike, there are two 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 dumbbells of uh, potential copper enriched mineralization, and this hole number twelve is uh, going to tell us whether or not this is the beginning of a major discovery. And uh, the only one 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 interesting additional thing they have drilled two more holes in the Adriana area after number 12. And I ask myself if they pull, you know, two, three hundred meters of uh, uh, pretty barren iron pyrite, uh, how, how much more holes would they drill? And also, the in the Pillar Vicky area, they won't be able to drill that until September. They have applied for permits. They expect to have them. The company's body language is showing everything that they are powering ahead, that they appear to believe they are onto something significant. The words, don't judge them by their words, judge them by their actions. This is going to be a very interesting August for Camino and Discovery Watchers. We'll have more Discovery Watch right after this. I'm Bill McWilliam, President of Cascadero Copper, CCD on the TSX Venture Exchange. Cesium is one of the world's rarest metals with a growing industrial demand. Drilling is underway on our Tehran property in Argentina to prove up a cesium resource. Cascadero's patent-pending leach process has the potential to make Cascadero the lowest-cost supplier of cesium in the world. Visit our website, cascadero.com, or phone us at 604-924-5504. Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa. Located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Kaiser. John, any new Discovery Watch candidates? I am looking at one which could be an absolute blockbuster discovery, one with a scale that we haven't seen since 1886 when the Witz Watersrand Reef was discovered in South Africa. The company is Novo Resources Corp. It's headed by Quinton Hennig, and uh, they have a project several projects in Australia, Western Australia to be precise, and in the northern part on what is called the Pilbara Craton. Now, it's really important to understand what the Pilbara Craton is. It's a 3.6 billion year old chunk of rock which appears to have been connected to the Capval Craton, which is where on which the uh, Witzwatersrand Reef sits. Now, just some geology here. The Witzwatersrand Reef is this phenomenal, uh, fairly narrow reef of quartz pebble conglomerate, uh, you know, half meter to two meter thick. It's laterally very extensive. It rims about 400 kilometers of the edge of this uh, 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 basin, the Witzwatersrand Basin, and dips a uh, hundred uh, uh, enormous of uh, 50, 60, 100 kilometers into the basin. 1.6 billion ounces have been mined since 1886. Another billion ounces sit in there, but you can't really get at it because it is too deep for humans to go down there and work in these uh, hot, confined uh, conditions. But the theory that uh, Quinton Hennig has always uh, wondered is if the Pilbara craton, which is similar age, um, was at that time connected to, 
to the uh, uh, Capfal Craton and subsequently wandered away 9,000 kilometers where it ended up being sutured onto uh, Australia, could not similar reefs have been discovered in the developed in the Pilbara. And this is not an original idea. And in this area there, there have been nuggets found. In fact, uh, near Karata in the beach area, uh, there's a whole industry with metal detectors. People buy metal detectors, and they run around the beaches there, and they do find these these nuggets, uh, many of them sort of flattened, watermelon-shaped uh, shaped gold nuggets. And, and no obvious source for these has ever been uh, been found. But the the theory that this Hemsley Basin uh, is similar to the Witzwatersrand Basin has definitely been tested by multiple companies, particular during the 70s when there was interest in uranium. Now, the Witzwatersrand uh, reefs, uh, they have high-grade gold, uh, you know, 10 grams per ton or higher, but they also have a meaningful amount of uranium, about 10, 10 15 times as much in terms of, of relative weight. So there was a lot of exploration done in the, on the Pilbara Craton in the 70s uh, and, and, and early 80s, and they did intersect the, the quartz pebble conglomerate reefs, uh, but the uranium mineralization tended to be low and the gold mineralization tended to be largely absent. And Quinton became interested in this whole story about uh, 13 years ago, ended up acquiring a uh, an option through Novo on something called the Beaton's Creek, which is sort of in the eastern part of the Hemsley Basin uh, in, in the Pilbara. And they did find golden conglomerate there. They have a, a modest resource that they're trying to, to develop. Uh, uh, but the whole story that he was trying to find an entire field, it ended up just being confined to what was originally known as the Beaton's Creek area and a few other prospects near there. But it didn't quite have the grade and the continuity and the size that puts it in the same league as the Witz Watersrand Reef. And I've watched this story from a, from a distance. Uh, Newmont was an early shareholder and is still a significant shareholder. Uh, there was a lot of hope, and the market priced that hope into the stock uh, that, yes, they would find something that could turn this into a 50 to $100 stock, and it would be at part that one fifty two dollars for a while. Jay Taylor has been a huge fan of this, uh, uh, telling everybody you absolutely have to own this. But almost everybody else kind of just stayed in the distance. And right now, the stock, as we talk, is about a dollar ninety. It's come up from sixty seventy cents. They did a twenty seven million unit financing at sixty cents a couple of months ago. This is not even free trading yet. And the and the stock. Uh, has a market cap with 160 million fully diluted uh, of almost 300 million dollars. So based on Beaton's Creek, it is overpriced. But something else happened. About last August, probably around now, Quinton got word that a bunch of prospectors were finding uh, all these gold nuggets 350 kilometers to the northwest of Beaton's Creek, and he tracked it down. And it turned out that somebody, uh, the, the, the story was uh, they, the car had pulled over to, to fix some problem like a flat tire. And, and, uh, and the passengers were sort of just shuffling around. They noticed some gold, uh, something golden in the dirt. And so I picked it up and checked it out. And lo and behold, it was gold nuggets. And they ended up doing further checking in the area. And, and they, they staked something that's now called Comet, Comet Well. And... Uh, it's part of an eight-kilometer corridor where there seems to be gold, not just in the alluvials floating around in the dirt, but also embedded in the rock. And Quinton understood the implications. Uh, everybody else just said, okay, we have another little alluvial gold placer thing here. It's, uh, you know, they, we, we've been chasing these things for a long time, never found any meaningful source, no big deal. But he understood that. Is it possible that he has been at the wrong end of the basin? That in fact it's over in this area that he should have been looking? So he went in there and staked 700,000 hectares of open land. Then he approached the prospectors and managed to wrangle a deal that got done in February where he can earn 80% of the, uh, of, of the project. And then he, uh, optioned 
50% of the gold rights in the entire land package that an Australian stock exchange junior called Artemis Resources owned. And they've been exploring for all kinds of stuff, nickel, gold, platinum, whatever. They, they, they are the largest landholder in that area. And so for a $2 million exploration obligation, Novo gets 50% of the gold rights. And the one part that really interested Quinton was the Purdy's Reward property, which is to the northeast of the Comet Well uh, property that he had optioned. And a week and a half ago, they published a news release, which uh, it was like some blast from the past. It included a couple of video clips, one of a, one of a, a dude with a, a, a metal detector, weep, 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 uh, you know, moving around, oh, there's something, there's something. And then, and then they got out a jackhammer and started jackhammering away, popping like bedrock, and lo and behold, they pick it up, and it's got this watermelon size, seed-sized gold that you can see visibly from the distance. And it's like, wow, this is the kind of con that they used to set up in the old days when they wanted to trick uh, um, people into buying some some sort of gold fraud type of thing. Except this is not some 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 questionable OTC bulletin board company. This is a real company with a PhD, Quentin Hennig, who has been thinking this stuff, uh, living and breathing it for, for decades. And uh, this looks like the beginning of something very significant. Uh, they have taken a um, sort of roughly meter by meter pit, about 700 kilos. They're doing a bulk sample. They should be getting results in a couple of weeks. The gold here is very different from what it is in the Wits Watersrand Reef. And this is where the controversy is very interesting. The Witzwatersrand gold is believed to have come about through two mechanisms. One is that the gold is alluvial gold eroded from all these veins and stuff in the green stones uh, in the hills above the basin, and the various rivers uh, dragged it down and ended up separating out and, and creating these uh, laterally extensive beds. And another theory is that uh, some sort of hydrothermal system came in and selectively managed to just creep through this particular reef horizon and create these fabulous 10, 10 to 2 ounce uh, gold mineralization. But both of those mechanisms are implausible. And in a, in a, in a paper published in 2012, Quinton and uh, his associates argued that the Witzwatersrand gold is actually a result of the unique conditions that exist 2.8 to 3 billion years ago when the, there was no oxygen, uh, when the only land was uh, was uh, the, the Ur continent, which uh, was smaller than Australia, where you had volcanoes spewing uh, hydrogen sulfide into the air, where the water, the seawater, any water was a poisonous brew that may have allowed gold to become very much more elevated than it is today, and that what happened during those few thousand years when those reefs were put down is that some kind of shock happened which caused the gold to precipitate out of the water and basically form little nucle nucleuses of, uh, of gold growing. The gold literally grew into existence. And then later on, when you had continued alluvial activity, the gold got reworked. The, the pyrite was also part of this. And a key part of this was early bacterial life. They had these algae growing there, building these mats in these areas. And the carbon in that may have also played a role to precipitate out this gold. So this these 2.6 2 billion ounces confined to about a one meter thick horizon of the Witz Watersrand Basin may literally have dropped out of the water as a result of a temporary freak condition that has never repeated itself anywhere else in the world. And Quentin's theory about the Pilbara is that if this was part of this, and the age dating says that it was, something similar should have happened. And he thinks, this, the reason he's, he's now tied up a million hectares, is he thinks under the cover there, obscured from, from the view, is another absolutely monstrous, potentially billion ounce Witz Watersrand type system. And in this area, the style of the mineralization, it's different than it is in the Witz Watersrand in that the nuggets are, are bigger and, and better formed and the host rocks tend not to be 
the finer quartz pebble type matrix. He says the it's more of a mixture of coarser uh, uh, greenstones and basalts, and so it's possible that they are higher up, closer to the shore, where the uh, uh, the, the, the the rivers and that dragging the uh, the the eroded material and sediments would have dropped out the heavier rocks first. But if all of this was underwater during that same time horizon and this bizarre event happened which changed the chemical conditions of the earth causing this precipitation event, then this part of Australia could also have something similar. So there's two discovery stories. Do they have something here with maybe 5 to 10 million ounces, which is going to be a bit troublesome to to measure, and then maybe the stock uh, ends up being, you know, worth five to ten dollars when they finally uh, figure out the protocols for evaluating uh, a super nugget effect system like this, or are we dealing with an entire gold field, possibly on the scale of the Wits Waters Rand, uh, with uh, this Australian company owning fifty percent of a good chunk, uh, Novo Resources owning a hundred percent of a seven hundred thousand hectare chunk and then also owning 80% of the initial focus where, as a freak of nature, the stuff managed to daylight and has been overlooked in the past 100 years, and some prospectors accidentally, through serendipity, ended up focusing on this. And Quentin Hennig, on behalf of Novo, understood the implications and has tied up a good chunk of this area. If this bigger picture scenario emerges, this will cause a huge, huge bull market in the resource sector, not just for the companies that happen to have exposure to this area, but because it endorses out-of-the-box thinking, creative undercover thinking. Thinking, It'll be like, for example, when Diamet discovered diamonds in the slave craton in 1992, where people said theoretically it was possible, but nobody's ever found anything, therefore there's nothing there. And then Diamet found it. The stock went to $60 within a year from $0.60, cents, $2 billion valuation, an area the size of Switzerland was staked. Hundreds of millions of dollars were spent within five, five, five to ten years, and, and multiple diamond mines emerged from that. And diamond exploration then took place all around the world. We're looking at a, something potentially similar unfolding here as a result of what Novo Resources Corp. thinks it has in the Pulbara Craton of Australia. John, thanks a lot for the update. You're welcome, Jim. We've been speaking with John Kaiser, his website, kaiserresearch.com. Discovery Watch will be back next week. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on Discovery Watch are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Discovery Watch is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.